Ego takes the wheel. They both snap! Oh my gosh! Welcome to coverage of the Infinity Gauntlet presented by 983 Media, day number three of coverage. I'm one of your hosts, Marie Bartholdi, joined by Moni Davuti and normally Moni. We are casting some Magic the Gathering, but today it is Snap. How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. I have been absolutely obsessed with this game over the past few months. So same, to get same. a chance to do some casting for it and just be involved in one of the first big events is really cool. Yeah, I'm super excited. And today we are in the loser's bracket. So this is everybody who didn't make it through on the winner's bracket. If you missed any of those videos, by the way, go and check them out. We have two from last week of the winner's bracket round number one, but we're starting today with loser's bracket round number one. But let's talk about how this tournament works overall, Monty. What's going on here this weekend? Yeah, Maria, we started things with 16 players from all across the card game spectrum. Names you're going to recognize if you've watched any sort of competitive card game across the last however many years. You're going to recognize some of the names here. 16 players came and everybody brought two decks. The first deck they were playing through the winner's bracket. And once they lose, they will have to switch to their second deck for the lower bracket. The only deck building restriction was across the two decks, they could only share a total of four cards. And the exception to that being Thanos and Galactus, only one copy of those across the decks. Uh, for the first round of each bracket, it is closed deck list. So because we are starting out at the lower bracket today, we're going to be having closed deck list. That means the players don't know what the other players brought for the matches we see today. Yeah, that's really important to keep in mind, everybody. They don't know what their opponent has in their deck, especially the first game. So players might be making decisions that you think are a little weird because you happen to know their deck list, but these players don't know the deck list of their opponent. Let's take a look at the bracket to find out what's already happened in our tournament. Like I said today, we are in the loser's bracket for round number one. So everybody we see is one of those players with a red down arrow next to their name. Didn't make it through with their first deck, but they've switched to their second deck for today's action so hopefully they will have better luck and we are kicking off today with cozy versus km best in losers bracket round number one talk to me about the decks these players brought Monty. let's start out with cozy yeah, this is really a battle of the conventional versus the unconventional. Cozy being the player that has brought, I don't want to say off meta decks, but definitely somewhat unconventional. Uh, we saw in the upper bracket, Cozy had brought a almost control deck trying to control the lanes. But today in the lower bracket, we're actually going to be seeing a Zabu Darkhawk deck from them. And this is going to be a battle of the Quinjet decks as well. So this Zabu Darkhawk deck really trying to make use of the cost reduction abilities on cars like Quinjet and Zabu to have explosive turns onwards from turn three, four. And Moon Girl really enables you to have that extremely explosive turn six that this deck is aiming to do. Yeah, they might have nerfed Zabu, but hey, still good enough. And uh, Darkhawk too, I love that card. Let's take a look at Cam Best List. Thanos, baby! Yeah, if Cozy is brought unconventional, then KM is very much conventional, bringing what is widely considered the best two decks in the meta game. His winner's bracket deck was the Shuri Red Skull deck that we see everywhere currently in the scene. But the lower bracket deck, this is the hotness. This is the Lockjaw Thanos deck that everybody is talking about. Absolutely dominating ladder and doing quite well in tournaments as well. A regular ban in tournaments that do feature a ban. So KM really trying to make use of the power of Quinjet alongside the Thanos stones to have extremely explosive early turns, continue drawing cards and just sculpting what almost feels like an unbeatable game plan at times. Do you have a deck you like better here, Monty? I think I would give a slight edge to KM just because of the existence of Leech in his deck. Against any deck that is trying to have an explosive turn five, turn six, if you can get a Leech down early, as this Lockjaw deck is able to do using cards like the Time Stone or Lockjaw to cheat it out, then you're going to have a really good time. And if KM can land a leech against Cozy on the crucial turns. This is going to be pretty hard for the Darkhawk deck to come back from it. All right, well, let's find out what's hap what, what's going to happen here. Cozy versus KM Best, loser's bracket, round number one. Loser goes home, their tournament is done. Let's find out what happens. All 
right, here we go. Cozy versus KM Best. Here in the loser's bracket, round number one, Wakandan Embassy is the first location revealed, Mani. Yeah, and the big thing here is, as we mentioned earlier, this is closed deckless. So KM, his deck is face up when Cozy can see that there's 14 cards left in it. Cozy knows he's against Thanos, but this Korg on turn one actually gives KM a lot of information because the only decks playing Korg right now are the Darkhawk decks in the format, along with Cerebro 2 that nobody probably brought to a tournament. Soulstone and Quinjet are kicking the turn off there for KM Best. Zabu, Corgan to Zabu for Cozy and Death's Domain, the location reveal. Could that change things? It could. KM is, of course, on Thanos, so does have access to the Reality Stone. We might just see that fired off this turn, mostly to get the draw off of it and continue smoothing out this draw. We do see Quinjet alongside a couple of stones, but KM's hand is still very expensive. So for at least next turn, he's looking for a play and is hoping to draw one off of this Reality Stone or the draw off the turn. Shadowland was a third location revealed as well. Power Stone going over there for KM. Agent Coulson for Cozy. And Reality Stone, like you said, is going to switch Death's Domain into Xandar. Yeah, Xandar doesn't really hurt uh, Cozy, but it does help KM out more, considering KM has a lot of cheap cards in his deck. Cozy is trying to go a bit bigger, so the power buff on Xandar isn't going to make a big difference to Darkhawk or Devil Dinosaur. Uh, Agent Coulson coming down, of course, does make things a little nicer for the curve here in case Cozy wants to do something, but that rock slide off the top is the really appealing one as it does set things up for Darkhawk going forward. Yeah, no Lockjaw here for KM in the Lockjaw Thanos deck. Is the deck still totally fine without it? The deck is fine. This is definitely one of the worst draws that this Thanos deck can have. As you see, there's a lot of expensive cards in KM's hand, but you're only able to cast two of these over the next two turns. So KM does have to make a choice about where things are going. Uh, Cozy on the other side, feeling pretty comfortable in the spot, knowing that he has a Shang-Chi in hand available. So for whatever KM plays, considering this game has led itself to big plays, uh, Cozy is ready. KM could have tried to juke this by playing the blue Marvel this turn, but that may just not be enough considering Cozy has played pretty big to the board with the units so far. Devil Dinosaur is going into Shadowland there for KM Best. Claw into Xandar for Cozy, which is going to pump up Shadowland. Well, like you mentioned, though, Shang-Chi in hand has got to make Cozy feel okay about where he's at right now in the game. Yeah, Cozy does have to be aware of the existence of Arrow. Of course, closed decklist means that you're not sure there's an Arrow, but you can at least reasonably assume there is one. So has to think about how he wants to play around that. But otherwise, just dropping Darkhawk and Shang-Chi here, trying to remove this Devil Dinosaur to win that lane and put some extra stats in Xandar is the best line that he probably has available to him. And for KM, just playing this Magneto, it is going to pull the Agent Coulson and the Rock Slide, but I think that is still not going to be enough to get through the Claw Shang-Chi lane uh, that Cozy has set up. And Cozy's throwing out the finger guns, hoping this is going to be enough. And <laughs> I believe it is going to be. There's Shang-Chi taking out the Devil Dinosaur. Darkhawk in the middle is enormous. And that Xandar Shadowland Cozy taking that one down. Yeah, that's definitely a nice win for Cozy to pick up in the first game, taking advantage of KM's slow draws. KM has the disadvantage here of his list being mostly face up, even in a closed deckless tournament, just because the Thanos Lockjaw decks are very much similar across deck lists. There's not that much deviation, so Cozy has a reasonable idea of what he's playing against, uh, whereas Cozy has some amount of unknown information and can use that to his advantage here. Yeah, huge in a tournament like this. Mojo World, Fist Tower, and Dream Dimension, the locations revealed here. Sunspot in the Mind Stone, happy to go into Mojo World that's just got stones to throw around into a location like that. Quinjet yeah. coming down two here is going to give the discount starting for KM, who's going to switch the third location to Subterranea. 
Okay, well, Subterranea is an absolute disaster for KM when you're playing against a Darkhawk deck. <laughs> yes, it Fortun is. Fortunately, Cozy does not have the Darkhawk in hand yet, and Limited turns to draw it, so that is the saving grace for KM, but you saw Cozy do a bit of a fist pump there, seeing the Subterranea come out. This draw is significantly better for KM. You do see Mindstone plus Quinjet. This is really the cornerstone of any powerful uh, Thanos draw, is having access to these two cards to fuel your hand, draw more stones most of the stones except for power draw a card so they replace themselves and you continue exploding onto the board so km is feeling significantly better about this game especially considering that leak just joined the hand from the reality stone there is quinjet and mystique copying quinjet as well for cozy giving huge discounts to cards pulled off of colson yeah, now has the Gamora Absorbing Man turn. Not something that you see very often, but <laughs> if Cozy can predict that KM is going to have to play to Mojo World this turn and just drops Gamora plus Absorbing Man there, that's a lane one immediately. There is Leech coming down for KM as well as a rock into Mojo World. Leech, the most hated card in Marvel Snap right now, Monty? Uh, definitely by some people. I think it really depends on who you ask. But it, Leech, it's very powerful for its effect. Yes, it's a 5-3, but the effect of removing the abilities from all the cards in your opponent's hand is oh. absolutely ridiculous. And you see a bit of a grimace there so from sad. Cozy, <laughs> completely juking with both Gamora effects. Gamora and Absorbing Man both hit nothing. That's unlucky right there. <laughs> Oh, sad. The saddest absorbing man ever. Absorbed nothing. Salt in the wound there, drawing a rock for the turn is the card with uh, an ability. Uh, doesn't actually have one. And you just see Cozy just playing She-Hulk rock into Mojo World, uh, trying to outstat KM there. Or at least match in a way where, uh, in the case of a draw, you can uh, try to do things. But this is going to be absolutely horrible against Arrow. Yeah, here's Arrow coming down for KM, right into Fist Tower, which is exactly where you want to play that Arrow. Cozy knows what's up. Yeah. There's no way. It, your play already doesn't feel good. You're playing 12 stats against 11 stats and hoping your opponent doesn't flow any mana with their Sunspot. Plus, right. you can reasonably assume they have an Arrow and there's a Fist Tower on the board. It's just best to get out of that game. Ooh, there's another Fist Tower this time, but this time's Cozy that's got the arrow in hand. Quinjet opening here for KM Best. Reality Stone, Power Stone, She-Hulk, and there's Lockjaw for KM. Yeah, KM cannot end this turn fast enough after drawing that Lockjaw. We may have seen, okay, Reality Stone come down, try to smooth out the hand, but this is the snap. This is the, I have Lockjaw, I'm going to play aggressively as you have to do with this Thanos deck because once you have this turn you are not going to get away with a snap unless your opponent's hand is absolutely insane for real I I mean do you, are you somebody that thinks anytime you have lockjaw you just snap playing Thanos hey I think most of the time especially if you have Quinjet lockjaw you should be snapping on turn two or three depending on what you've seen from your opponent there are corner case scenarios where you don't but they're far and few in between and now we see the raw power of this Lockjaw Thanos deck there. Thanos coming out, Devil Dinosaur off of two stones. Like, it's just disgusting. It is. You have left yourself really vulnerable to Shang-Chi there. And something that can cannot do is play around the Shang-Chi by dumping some cards out of the hand. So all the progress that KM made last turn is just gone. And that means that Cozy has the advantage on the board. And we see KM... Almost in the same situation as the first game, where his hand is all expensive cards. One saving grace for that pass here is the She-Hulk, uh, severely reduced from the previous turn. We may just see the Shang-Chi fired off here as some stats, even though you don't reasonably expect to get anything from it. And... Ooh, this could be bad. <laughs> yeah, this is actually disastrous because Cozy has the priority here. So KM playing these cards into the Lockjaw lane, if Cozy just drops Thanos, it just drops Arrow and Fist Tower, as he likely will do, KM will get annihilated. Ooh, there goes Arrow pulling the stone over into Fist Tower. Lockjaw gets no food. Yeah, KM has Magneto, so Magneto and Fist Tower will do almost the same thing that Cozy just did to KM. It'll destroy both the Agent Colson and the Shang-Chi and give you 22 power in that lane. So that's 
what Cam is hoping for. And Cozy needs to find a way to be able to beat that because otherwise you are just going to lose to this Magneto. You need to have more than two power in each of those lanes after this Magneto resolves. And it, one of the disastrous things is because Cozy is a Zabu deck, a lot of the cards here are also in the situation where they just get pulled by Magneto. Yeah, that's true. And there's Magneto pulling two cards into Fist Tower, shooting them both down. Math. <laughs> One power. <laughs> wow, 25 in Fist, in Fist Tower is going to do it. Oh, Cozy takes that one. Really heads up Korg play in the middle lane, knowing that if KM just plays Magneto as is the best play he has available to him, he is going to be forced to tie one of those lanes to the Korg, and that's exactly what happens. Here you see KM aggressively snapping with a turn one Mind Stone. Because you're in Dire Straits, you need to force Cozy to be playing for more cubes early. It, going into round five when cubes double anyways in battle mode, you need to put yourself in a better position than how far behind KM is right now. The old turn one Mind Stone snap. There's Mind Stone Sunspot starting things off for KM and Soul Stone into the hub. Zabu and Quinjet into Stark Tower for Cozy. Yeah, Cam has not really had one of those explosive Thanos draws yet. We saw the Lockjaw draw in the previous game, but pulling out two big things that left you vulnerable to Shang-Chi is not exactly where you want to be against a Shang-Chi deck, and Cozy took full advantage of that. So even though Cam has access to that leech, we've only seen him be able to play it once so far. Yeah, Rock Slide is going to get Cozy's game plan right online here. Start filling up KM's de deck, which was already pretty large. She-Hulk into Necrotia, Power Stone, Time Stone. Looks like it's going to be the play here for KM. Yeah, and Cozy has one of the best cards in this deck, this Moon Girl. Uh, just giving you such massive discounts with your Quinjet and Zabu on the cards he generates. So Cozy feeling pretty good with Double Heart Darkhawk in this spot. Oh, look at how cheap all of Cozy's cards are. This is a dream. Yeah, they, they've really slashed the prices on these cards. <laughs> Get them now while the discount's good. I mean, you know, the play of Zabu really went down, of course, after the nerf. But I don't know. I, he's looking great here with double Darkhawk into Hub and Necrotia. Magneto's going to try and screw stuff up, though. But, I mean, still going to take that lane go. most probably. Yeah, unless Cam draws the Shang-Chi in his deck here, uh, that lane is going to be lost. So uh, Cam knows that you're very much... Uh, you could play a Devil Dino there and win that lane and just hope that Cozy can't contest in the other two lanes, but it's a bit of a gamble. I think Cam is actually in a decent spot here. If you play your Devil Dino, that is going to be enough with six cards in hand to win the Necrotia lane. Ooh, okay. See what players do here on the final turn. Four cubes on the line here. Looks like... <laughs> <laughs> this is a tough decision. Yeah, Cozy has to win both of these lanes if he believes that Cam can contest the Necrotia lane. If you think that KM can't, you're in a good position. But otherwise, if you can't put yourself in a winning position in both of these lanes, Cozy might just be looking at a retreat here. Yeah, I feel like he's thinking about it. That that face to me is the face of someone who's thinking about a retreat. Oh, wow. And KM is actually going to give up on the Necrotia lane, but Cozy doesn't know that. So Ooh. considering can't find the win wow. in those two lanes in the left and the middle lane, just retreats and... I like how Cozy is playing. This is extremely disciplined. You're not gambling. And now you're going into the high stakes rounds where you still have a significant life total advantage over your opponent in terms of the cues remaining for you. This is decent for Cozy. Yeah, you saw Cozy's reaction there uh, when the Nexus popped up. Kind of raised his eyebrows like, hey, I've got a lot of cards that can really abuse that location. Yeah, so <laughs> the Nexus game is always interesting because... Both players have access to Shang-Chi, and both players know the other half Shang-Chi now. So it is going to be a nice little dance of how much do you commit to it, or whether KM just wants to get rid of it before Bye. we ever get to that dance. <laughs> yeah, Reality Stone's going to take it out. Project Pegasus is going to replace think, it there. I think KM might just snap on this. You have access to Lockjaw Leech now, with your Ooh. opponent having a pretty big turn. Hey, I... 
I would love to see a snap here from KM, even though I understand if you snap, you're locking yourself into being a do or die on this game. So you don't want to risk it. It, it feels like such a nice spot to try to get away with it. Once you leash, your opponent might not stay in the game. And here we go. Devil Dino here into the vault for Cozy, as well as Agent Colson as he tries to <laughs> put out his hand for something great to happen. But you're getting leeched, bro. Yeah, Co Cozy had the fingers crossed. <laughs> you see the salute as uh, the leech comes down. And this is really the disaster scenario, especially with Cam hitting Space Stone. Uh, can move that, open up more space in this Lockjaw lane. Now the Shang-Chi for the Devil Dinosaur. This is just all working out here for Cam. Yeah, Cozy is going to have to settle for a rock slide into Pegasus. Shang-Chi shoots down Devil Dinosaur. And let's see what we get with Lockjaw. It's a sunspot. Yeah, now with KM having Devil Dinosaur of his own, can play to the vault, and knowing that you've played, uh, you've leached most of your opponent's hand, you're feeling pretty safe uh, about Cozy not being able to beat you in that lane uh, with something like a Shang-Chi, or just playing Arrow, moving your opponent's cards, and I think Cozy is going to try to contest with just the stats Arrow in the mid lane, but Arrow's from KM is going to say no to that, and that means the vault is... Currently locked up for KM. Looking at Cozy's list, there's nothing that would contest that. So KM knows that he has one lane for sure. Now right. the question is, how do you win a second? Right, exactly. The vault locked up on three here. As we enter the final turn, high stakes, round number five. I think one option for KM is just playing Magneto into New York uh, alongside moving the Soul Stone there and knowing that you have a ton mm. of stats and whatever your opponent has there is going to be reduced in cost. Uh, it's a little risky, but I think it gives you a decent chance of winning. Uh, as things stand, unless you play the Devil Dinosaur and nothing else, you're not moving the Sunspot off the mid lane or the Slot Shop uh, as you need the three power there to win the vault so the question is what does km think gives him the best stats here just trying to contest two lanes might be the answer we do know i believe that there's still one stone left in the stack so this mind stone will replace itself it is basically free to play and the question for cozy is are you retreating again wow sure is cozy is out of there and km best staying alive and uh, but he was on death's door, it looked like, for a while there, but almost evening things up here with Cozy. Yeah, it's really the power of the leech. Cozy had so many of the key cards in his hand just doing, in his deck, just doing nothing in the hand that game. And it, you saw how that came back to really uh, pay off for KM later on in the game. And I go back to, should KM have just snapped on that Lockjaw leech? Yeah, turn? yeah. It, it's true. tough putting your entire tournament line as tournament life especially in the losers bracket on the line here but considering you already have your back against the wall do you just do it and cozy says yeah. <laughs> all right let's play for it all all right here we go there's a snap from km here in round number six sunspot time stone quinjet in play for cozy here uh lockjaw in hand and it's gonna get played immediately with, with the time zone into strange academy for km yeah, notably, Cozy does have five life. KM only has four. So Cozy has a game to lose here. KM, this is do or die. Mystique's going to copy that Quinjet. Lockjaw went and fetched up a soul stone out of KM's library. And it's leech time, baby. Yeah, Cozy... <laughs> His entire game plan relies on this Dark, Dark Hawk, so I think he has to be aware of the existence of Leech. And you see him shaking his head, and I love this play. Play the Dark Hawk, try to dodge the Leech, and yep. it's still a disaster. You see Cozy, this is not the card you want to see. This is the most important card in the matchup, and when the Thanos deck has it, it is disastrous. Ooh. So Shang Cozy is feeling horrible now oh. about the position, and... KM, I think, is going to push this game firmly into his favor from what was a 4-8 disadvantage in terms of cubes to what is looking to be a 4-1 advantage going into the next game. Rock slide into Strange Academy. No abilities from that leech. There's Shang-Chi taking down the Dark Hawk. Cozy's just got to shake his head. And it fetches up a Space Stone, which is also great. 
in a lockjaw lane. Here go everybody <laughs> moving locations from Strange Academy. Couple into Death's Domain as well as that rock slide for Cozy there. But keep in mind, uh, Cam's also still got that reality stone in hand. Cozy does not have priority, but does have this arrow. So you could arrow into the Strange Academy uh, as both players have access to the arrow, of course. And KM, knowing that he can win Death's Domain using Reality Stone, he has priority. So even if there's a card in Cozy's hand with an ability, KM is going to arrow it into Strange Academy before it matters. And I think KM is feeling confident that this game is his to win and is going to push it to a 4-1 cube advantage. KM looking confident here as we enter the final turn. Arrow, time zone in Strange Academy now. Cozy... Going through the options here once most of your deck has been leached is never a place you want to find yourself, but it's where we're at in the meta right now. Yeah, it, you know, going into the match, I said that I thought KM was favored thanks to that leech, and then he spent quite yeah. a few games not drawing it, and Cozy built up a considerable advantage, but ultimately, that's the beauty of battle mode. Hold on, this warrior Whoa. falls is a disaster. <laughs> Reality is so and cozy knows cozy knows exactly how much of a disaster it is. Oh my god! No. Warrior falls off the reality stone is gonna give Cozy the victory there in that match. You saw his reaction, and hey, that's one of the things about reality stone. Sometimes your reality is great, and sometimes you get screwed. There's a reason you see people playing cards like Rhino and uh, most importantly Storm over Scarlet Witch is. Sometimes the location you transfer to backfires, and that is the downside of Reality Stone. So many locations would have won the game there for KM, but unfortunately, Warrior Falls is not one of them, just decimating three of his stones and getting the game win for Cozy. All right, so that is Cozy taking down that match versus KM Best. So that means KM Best, unfortunately, is out of the tournament. Cozy stays alive to fight another round. More snap to this. It's the Infinity Gauntlet, and we're still in round one of the Losers Bracket. I'm Nathan Zamora, a.k.a. That's Admirable. I'm joined by Mani Davuti, and Mani, it has been quite a while since we've been able to sit down and have a talk about some stuff. Uh, I'm glad we're getting to do it today, but with Marvel Snap, uh, we, our second match here is Frodan versus Mogwai, and we got some pretty cool decks that are coming into this one. Yeah, we really do. Frodan, especially, just looking at the deck that he's brought, I'm pretty excited to see it in action because it's a little spicy. It's not something you see too often in the meta. Uh, he's gone for a bit of a ramp deck. We saw a ramp deck in his first round in the upper bracket as well, but this deck is a little different. You see Professor X, you see Destroyer. It almost feels old school, but you're not seeing things like Spectrum that have previously been comboed with these cards. So really just trying to control the aspects of the game. Yeah, Frodan is, I want to mention, a free-to-play player. He takes great pride in that as well, so he is going to be using the best of what he can put together without buying season passes, without put, putting any dollars whatsoever in there. I, when I was playing with him, I saw the welcome bundle still sitting in the store, and I was like, wow, Frodan is, is honestly kind of killing it without spending any dollars in the game, Show, showing that time and uh, a little bit of skill can get it done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mogwai, too. Al almost. Almost. There's a, there's a Thanos. And a, and a <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm almost the same. Almost. I love how you just take like the complete opposite stance on that one, and it's just the, <laughs> uh, yeah, very interesting. Uh, Mogwai definitely is going to play to win. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I, I think that, that Mogwai, while well, at times, can be very creative. This is a tournament at the end of the day, and so they're competing for a $3,000 prize pool in an Invitational. You want to pick up the wins in this one. Uh, you know, I absolutely cannot imagine, for the life of me, not playing this deck if I had access to these cards. Yeah, and this is, it, it, it is worth mentioning, not the Thanos deck. This is not the Thanos Lockjaw deck that we have seen everywhere. This is a little different. This is a Thanos Carnage Polaris Daredevil deck. There's a lot more control going on here than we've seen in other Thanos decks. Of course, you do still have some of the key cards like Quinjet, but you're not seeing Lockjaw, you're not seeing some of those role players. Instead, you're seeing a lot more control. 
And it's, re it's going to be really interesting to see how this deck from Mogwai lines up against a non-traditional deck from Frodan. Yeah, I am kind of curious. Uh, so let's get into the gameplay here and then we'll find out what's going to end up happening. All right, so our first game is kicking things off, and I really do want to shout out to the idea of it having a bit more control in these ones. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's a very, I have a direct quote from Frodan exactly about this. He said that his strategy coming into the tournament was, quote, I'm down for Weird World. My decks are just worse than my opponents. Yeah, I mean, this is, he's being put to the test right now. He drew the reality stone immediately. If he was, he could get rid of, rid of Weird World. But as you said, I think Frodan is down to play this dance and just let the Weird World stay, sending the message here to Mogwai. I'm okay playing this game, are you? And honestly, I don't think Mogwai minds too much. Yes, of course, you don't have the stones, but you have a Quinjet on turn one in a Weird World game. You wow. have of discount on everything. You have an Elysium active for the rest of the game if you're Mogwai. And Frodan is gonna be drawing Infinity Stones. Oh my gosh, he storms right away as well. I'm actually kind of curious about this from Mogwai's spot. So we are still in the round one of the loser's bracket. So the opponents have no idea what their opponents have brought to the table. They haven't seen their decks before. They have to swap when they drop to the loser's bracket on this one. So with Quindred in play, I feel like it is somewhat of a risk to say, you know what? I don't want to have all my cards be discounted by one. I want my deck to function as I intend. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Of course, you know that you've already lost one stone, now two stones, one of the big ones being the space stone, of course. But I think still Mogwai has faith, faith in the power of the Thanos deck and wants to play to his own strengths rather than allowing Frodan to take advantage of him. You see the follow-up to the storm here with two cards uh, in the Sunspot and the Armor. Sunspot, a classic uh, combo with Storm just allowing you to it, essentially float energy in order to grow it at any point, meaning that you're not locked out of the lane. And that is going to be pretty strong against Frodan, but the other side, the Electro and Comertage, this has been devastating in the history of Snap. It definitely uh, is meant, it meant more to function on curve with Frodan's deck. He's not playing like, you know, wild Galactus plays or, or there's no sunspot in play currently, things like that. So he's purely reliant on just the raw power you get from this and unlocking your fives early, unlocking your sixes early and making just three strong power plays in a row. So I'm curious to see if he can take significant advantage of that. We see Shang-Chi in hand as well on Frodan's side. So that's a pretty strong play on Monster Island. But can you take advantage of having this Magneto this early, of having a uh, hobgoblin early on like what what is the sequence here from Frodan's side is is really where my question's at yeah you have no information so it's really tough to make a play like the professor x that's just a big gamble uh you have the magneto and the shang chi uh and the jessica jones that are all very viable options here jessica jones and Comertage, very powerful uh magneto here will draw the storm out and try to fill that lane potentially depending on what Mogwai has done. So it, you can see sort of the idea here from Frodan. It's not really going to work out how he wants, considering he's now given essentially uh, the flooded lane to Mogwai and has capped out on Comertage thanks to that Polaris. So now you see that Mogwai feels safe to snap. And I don't know if Frodan can stay in this game. This is pretty wild. I, I'm not seeing a ton of big power plays that Frodan can make at this point. Like I'm, I was looking, is there anything wild with Destroyer you could do? But the way that I'm seeing this is it's minus one cube, a pretty wild start to this one. I'd say, I have to say that, that Mogwai changing the weird world and saying, I want to operate with my own deck instead of discounted cards across the table. He completely obliterated what Frodan's strategy was coming into the tournament. I'm down for weird world. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it, it's important to note that it wasn't just changing Weird World a la Reality Stone that we normally see from the Thanos deck because he had access to Frodan's Storm. Making that lane flooded and then locking it up using the Sunspot armor just oh. made things so much better for him. My gosh. Okay, this is I, not better for him. <laughs> I, ha I have to look over this now in detail because this was something I had not considered coming into the tournament was specifically 
the peak. I looked at pretty much every location and tried to figure out how it was interacting. This is one of the ones that it was just so much to go over that I had to look at in the moment. So I'm looking at like Hobgoblin being a zero cost, five power. Something like that's a really big deal in this one. When I look over at Mogwai's deck, uh, I feel like this is a detriment at the end of the day. We're looking at Thanos, uh, Magneto, She-Hulk, like so many cards on, on Mogwai's side got hit by this. It feels like on Frodan's side, there's a couple of cards where it's a disadvantage. Yeah, most of your cards are unaffected. Your stones being the big ones, unaffected. Uh, we do see the Power Stone, of course, uh, becoming a 3-1, or in this case now 2-1, thanks to the Quinjet. So that loses a decent amount of its power level. Uh, for Frodan, this Hobgoblin, you can combo it with your Cosmo. So you have a 0-5 that you don't give to your opponent. But this is... It, this is the beautiful Cosmo read from Frodan, and I don't know if Frodan's going to get away with a snap in this game, but he is <laughs> definitely going to win this game. And the immediate concession there, retreat, yeah. I guess I should say, from Mogwai, knowing there's no coming back from that one in this spot. And I, I love seeing Frodan just take it so casually where he just, he loves the wild and wacky outcomes from this. You know, we, we came from like the background of Hearthstone. We're super big into TFT right now. It's kind of like the more variables you add to it, at the same time, like even though it's increasing variance, at the same time, that often adds skill to it as well because there's so much accountability to be had with it. And this is just something that he absolutely loves to see are just bizarre and wild outcomes. Yeah, and this hand from Frodan is decently Ooh. nice. You have Electro into Prof X. The bigger problem right now for Mogwai is he had to fire off that time stone on turn two, not something you ideally want to do. You'd love to use it on turn three to get into your power five mana play, five cost plays, uh, but he found nothing. So yes, there's a She-Hulk. You get advantage from not using the energy this turn to get a discount to She-Hulk next turn, but that time stone was mostly to try to fix your draws because Mogwai had quite an awkward hand before this. Rodan has, has got some some gambits here that are available. Like, say he's to rip Professor X on Monster Island. And it looks like he's thinking oh about it. Oh my gosh. So and this, this is, is going to pay off. Oh my good, This is huge. You have Destroyer as well for the other lanes. Like, this is like massively powerful if this pays off the way that, that Rodan's hoping that it will. Now, I will say that I think when you're making a play like this, you should be snapping because you are not getting away with a snap after this resolves if it works and i think it's more worth for you as the control deck to try to gamble for cube wins here as you essentially are just locked into uh one cube now if you're going to win this game you're never getting away with it your opponent now sees what your play is as well because of daredevil so i think that frodan is they're thinking on is either just a they're forgetting to snap or B, it's like, ah, is it still worth it? You do have one of your lanes locked up, but is is that good enough? Yeah, I think all things considered, something like Shang-Chi can still just completely obliterate you. Arrow can be a play that sometimes your opponent can get away with and, and really make use of it. If if there's no counterplay on Mogwai's side to this destroyer, it completely changes the landscape. But if they do have a counterplay, they're, they're getting away with this one just com completely hands-free. Like There's no way Frodan wins if there's a strong counterplay on Mogwai's side. And Mogwai has priority, so the Shang-Chi in hand isn't counterplay. Uh, so Frodan knows that because of the priority situation, they're getting away with the Destroyer not getting Shang-Chi this turn. And then you have armor as the follow-up once you add 30 power to the Shuri's lab, thanks to the doubling. So you can actually protect, and that means Mogwai needs to fight for priority here, even if it means just burning this arrow, because you can't let your opponent protect this destroyer. My gosh. And yeah, there's the arrow just for pure numbers. Destroyer yeah. comes down takes care saw, of the uh, the one card restriction. You saw Frodan really wanted to hobgoblin that space throne, but you can't do it on your opponent's daredevil turn because they'll just play around <laughs> it. <laughs> and a little shake of the head from them because that would have been really sweet. And you might have gotten away with it if it wasn't for that pesky daredevil. And then once again, Mogwai having priority here is such a big difference into this one. But the Shang-Chi is, I think this is often going to be enough, but sometimes your opponent's just going to have another big play in this lane. And then the question is the tiebreaker on it, because there's not like a ton of plays 
that Mogwai has with this. You know, we were looking at a stone next to a Shang-Chi or a carnage is, in the middle lane next to it. Is Froda not playing to Space Stone? The Space Throne? This is a little dance here. Frodan it notably destroyed uh, the Electro the previous turn, so it can play multiple cards now. That was one of the things that was really uh, gatekeeping Frodan here. But with not having priority, your armor is not going to protect your destroyer. So this is a little dance between the players of who is going to play more to Shuri's lab. Because if Mogwai just plays Shang-Chi to Shuri's lab and a small thing to Space Throne, and Frodan plays anything to Space Throne, he's going to win the game. At the same time, if both players play Magneto, that's a favor yeah. for Mogwai. Frodan's committed to Space Throne, so is Mogwai, and that's going to be a win for Mogwai thanks to the tiebreaker. Wow. That is really close. It, you saw both players play to Shuri's lab at one point during that turn and then take the play back. And if either of them had gone through with that play, <laughs> that would have changed things. So <laughs> the dance of how to play these razor thin edges turns is just one of the joys of Snap and this uh, simultaneous turn system. Something that I, I've learned a lot by watching Mogwai stream is that he pours through all of these decisions very quickly. And so he's trying to look at everything all at once and figure out well, what am I supposed to be doing here? And a lot of things I think of is, is visualization. Like in your head, you need like a, a touch of that visual to see what's really going on. And so he'll, he'll play stuff and then he'll return the options and then play stuff and then return the options until finally it kind of clicks in his head where it's like, oh, no, 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 this one works because of X, Y, Z. And I just, it's, it's very fascinating to watch in real time where hey, both players up? are kind of doing that exact same thing and then how they both land on the exact same decision at the end of it. It's just, it's such a fascinating thing to me. Yeah, just making taking full advantage of that turn timer, right? There's, uh, you know, both of us have come from games where there's an emphasis on playing fast. But when it comes to having a limited turn timer, that is time for you to use. You should use it to think through these lines and make sure that you have all the bases covered, or at least all the ones that you can think of. Yeah, it put you under time pressure because you can't just call a judge. Uh, this is really cool for Mogwai trying to use the Polaris to snipe the Sunspot into Warrior oh Falls goodness. before it can get out of hand. Frodan can read this and go for a storm in the Warrior Falls uh, if he wanted to. He does, of course, know the Polaris is in the deck now from the previous games. Uh, but if he goes for the storm elsewhere, maybe in Baxter Building, as it looks like he's doing, then he's going to lose his Sunspot. And <laughs> it... <laughs> Storm or nothing works as well. Like, if you storm Warrior Falls, or if you do simply nothing, the Polaris is a negative outcome. Yeah, Frodan has so far played Storm to Baxter Building, Storm to Los Diablos, taken it back both times, and Baxter Building, unfortunately, the choice for Frodan is going to backfire immensely here. Yeah, no reaction from Frodan. He realizes it right at the end. He goes, yeah, that's not good. Where does this Los Diablos hit? If it hits the flooding, it, that would have been, I, I would say, advantage for uh, Mogwai there, who doesn't have a great play into it. Yeah. Uh, Frodan oh has gosh. no play here, though, so he'll just have to retreat to the snap. Yeah, Frodan drew uh, Electro, which is, I think, not ideal in this spot. The snap coming in from Mogwai, I think that Frodan is wise to sacrifice a cube here. But I can, I can see something coming out in his favor. I think it's unlikely. Yeah, he's going to take, I think, a, a pretty wise retreat there. Sacrifice your cube. You still have plenty more in the pool. And as you move into higher and higher stakes here, you just want to have like at least enough to snap, I feel like. So now we've moved in the high stakes rounds. Frodan, I think, has one more retreat in the books, but I think that you're gonna have to make these retreats very obvious. I think if this first one is not super obvious that you're playing for the for the round at that point. I think Mogwai with this hand could try to put pressure on Frodan and snap early. You have Quinjet, you have Mindstone. This is the makings of the best draws from this Thanos stack. Of course, there's no Lockjaw in this version that Mogwai has brought that is worth mentioning. So the uh, Lockjaw draws are not available. So what more can you ask for here? And I think if I'm in Mogwai seat, I want to be snapping and putting the pressure on Frodan. When you have a nine to six cube advantage, you want to be putting Frodan under pressure. 
It, it's an interesting idea to me as well. I think that seeing the rocks come out, uh, not something that either player really likes to see in a spot like this. I don't know, maybe for Odin, he's, he, again, he kind of likes the wacky stuff here. <laughs> well, I mean, this is this is the standard outcome for Mogwai right now, is if, if there's rocks, you draw a rock. That's kind of the, tends to be the rule. Going back to the snap though, it's kind of an interesting spot because if Mogwai can pick up a win here, that actually takes away Froden's ability to snap the game. So if you can trick your opponent into sticking around for four cubes, I feel like that's an outcome that, that actually favors you here. It definitely is. And you see Froden committing the Electro to the Hala lane, hoping that Mogwai is going to play in a way this turn that is going to allow Froden to lose the Electro and have access to potentially more plays um, in the future turns. Of course, if Mogwai doesn't play in a way that he has the advantage in Hala, likely won't do it the next turn. So 1-1 oh, one, is rock. a thought that Mogwai is happy with. The old third rock. And these rocks are not disastrous when you have this carnage that Mogwai just drew, so you at least have the out of that if you want to. I'll look at Mogwai's spot and figure this out, too. <laughs> It, it looked like Frodan was thinking about putting a Hobgoblin in Hala. I don't think that's what you want to do. That's... I think that is not in your advantage. Professor X and Subterranea, I like this a lot more. You have a Sunspot there, you don't want your opponent to be able to remove it. Of course, this is still closed deckless because we are in the first round of Loser's Bracket. So Frodan doesn't know if Mogwai has uh, an answer to the Sunspot, you don't typically expect Thanos X to be playing something like Killmonger unless it's the destroy version with death. So now you feel like you have a lane locked up. You haven't seen a blue Marvel yet from Mokwai. So it, at least in this spot, you feel like you have one lane. Leech comes into hand as well. I think for this to work out, Froden needs a pretty major power play. Yeah, and <laughs> the worst part here for Frodan is if he goes for something like Hobgoblin uh, in Hala and Mogwai sees it, Mogwai can just go, all right, I'll drop three rocks there. Yep. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's fine. Or even Space Stone so you can move something off of that lane and commit more power to it next turn. So Frodan needs to go for the leech considering your opponent has seven cards in hand and a Quinjet. They can play around your Hobgoblin, so... Great play from Frodan, just making reading that you can't play this Hobgoblin against the Daredevil turn and playing around it. Now putting the onus on uh, Mogwai to act. If you want one of those big Carnage turns to take advantage of these rocks in your hand and this Quinjet discount that you have, you need to do it right now or not at all. It's looking like a big Carnage turn. Or maybe yeah, just big enough. I'm liking that. Yeah, try to decide how much to commit. The space zone coming down really helpful because it gives Mogwai flexibility as to the ability to play to either lane next turn. The left lane already looks pretty one uh, for Mogwai. That is the fourth rock being drawn for those keeping count at home. Mogwai having a fantastic time here. It is the standard for Mogwai. Rocks and deck equals draw rocks. That's yep. the fifth. That that yeah. It's the just meme, the rule. The meme prophecy is complete. <laughs> as was foretold. I feel like Mogwai is feeling great about this spot. You're adding twelve power to the right. You have enough in the left. And so your your opponent's able to play one card and one card only. I feel yeah. like it's difficult to be afraid in a spot like this for, for Mogwai. Yeah, your opponent can play one card. Shang-Chi doesn't particular her particularly hurt you anywhere and just being a little tricksy moving things around and Frodan uh, considering a retreat once again but it looks like uh, they're going to commit and if that ends up being the case that's going to put Frodan back against the wall no yeah. discipline retreat I love seeing this from Frodan understanding the strengths of the deck and just making sure yeah okay <laughs> you got a snap yeah I think it's a good retreat at the end of the day. You still have one more available to you, should it be the case. This feels like a spot now where Mogwai can definitely pressure that stake, though. Like, if the edge is close, I feel like you can justify it a bit more. But again, when, when you're way ahead, I feel like sometimes, uh, you know, conservative play can be good. It just really depends on how the matchup, how much volatility there is. 
and so forth. So Oscorp Tower is opening things up. Both players have a sunspot on the open as well. And so nothing like too wild coming into play. Nothing super restrictive on the locations thus far. Yeah, we may see with Nita Valir this play of Mogwai just playing Carnage there. Uh, Mogwai doesn't have a stone heavy hand anyways. No Quinjet, so you're not going to get heavy discounts over the upcoming turns. Nita Valir means that Carnage is just a seven power card. So hey, I wouldn't be surprised to see it played there. And I wouldn't hate to see it, though, of course, with Sunspot, you have other uses for that energy. Ooh. Wow, Frodan rips Electro this turn, which is massive. Electro on the Oscorp Tower can actually be just like the game winning spot as well. You get an extra energy and you limit your opponent to one card a turn. Yeah, and with nothing to do really for Mogwai, does have the Cosmo, does have the Carnage, but neither of those are looking exciting. Hey, if your opponent snaps you on that spot, you do not want to risk it when you have <laughs> such a commanding lead, so. I, I like wouldn't want to risk it either. It seems foolish. <laughs> That's the kind of play that Froden can make from behind as well. It says, you know what? If it's good enough, it's good enough. Let's play for it all. Yeah, you have to pick and choose the positions you have. And Froden has been disciplined. This game has been retreating at what has felt like all the right spots. So making the right choices. And that gives him some cubes to work with still. Valir in the middle of center again. Feels like maybe this is the featured location for this particular match now. Grand Central as well, so some more wild stuff that comes in. Where I feel like this could be really beneficial for the style that Frodan's deck is playing as well, where it's kind of meant to play one card at a time. So Grand Central just gives you some extra stuff sometimes. Yeah, Electro decks absolutely love uh, to see Grand Central. Uh, what Frodan doesn't love to see is. Avengers compound, I would say. So, especially when you're playing Professor X, you don't really want your opponent to be, you and your opponent to be forced to play into the same lane. Uh, it does look like Froden is going with the Storm here, but it didn't look like it was going to Avengers compound. So I'm curious where Froden thinks it's best suited. I would guess Nita Valir, just because your opponent has a lot more cheap cards than you do. Yeah, that's gonna be the case. Polaris is going to shift some of this, though, but not a huge follow-up that Mogwai has after this. Like, if Frodian just has a big play into flooding, that's kind of enough to get it done. Jessica Jones is the classic big play, right? It's, <laughs> we've seen Jessica Jones and Storm for what feels like all of Marvel Snap. Uh, Cosmo here from Mogwai will stop the on reveal ability from Jessica Jones, but it's not enough stats. Uh, Mogwai only has five power there, so the Cosmo won't actually really stop anything. And it, looking at the style of Frodan's deck, uh, Mogwai has to be aware of what the options sort of are in this spot. Mogwai has seen uh, Daredevil from Frodan, so knows that could add two power there. Uh, but I don't know if Mogwai has seen the Jessica Jones yet. I don't think so either. So like you said, despite the fact that it shuts it off, this is still a plus one. That's something I'm sure Frodan is happy with, but honestly, your deck doesn't have to do everything. It has to do enough. Yeah, Frodan has to be a little worried still about uh, Blue Marvel. It, they haven't seen the full deck for Mogwai. This is closed deckless still because it's the first round of losers. So there could be a blue Marvel that pushes that lane over. But if you're Frodan, you're not really in a position to fight that. And notably, depending on how this Grand Central grows, Frodan could just lock up the game here and now if Mogwai gets any of Time Stone, Soul Stone, or Daredevil put in and Frodan gets the Professor X put in, the game's over, it's done. Goodness, neither player feels like they're in a good spot either. Like, look at it both hands. It's like the bluff snap feels like it could be the big one here. It's like my hand is so bad that I can't really do anything. Like, from Frodan's position, it's hard to, to, you know, bluff on the snap here because that's your whole tournament at stake at that point. From Mogwai's side, though, I can see the bluff snap coming into effect, although it does have some heavy downsides to it. Ooh. Mogwai considering emptying the hand of the smaller cards just to make the Grand Central a little better. It doesn't actually empty, Ooh. though. Only one of the stones 
Sunspot as well. I think this spot is amazing for Frodan. Shang-Chi? Oh, he was going for the oh. She-Hulk, and the leech just completely takes that away. Oh, the leech here is devastating. Now Frodan can just dump raw stats into Avengers Compound with the Magneto. Mogwai has a Magneto of their own. And that's the card off the top, right? That Magneti Magneto has abilities. Yeah, this is massive. Frodan with this Magneto would pull Cosmo and Polaris. I think Frodan needs to play the Magneto into the left lane. You cannot be affording to pull that Cosmo and give your opponent extra stats. If you play into the left lane and your opponent has a fresh Magneto, that's like that is like the lost scenario for that. If your opponent has a fresh Magneto, I believe the game is a tie. You're currently down one there, up one in the middle, and tied on the right lane. Your opponent has no reduction, so you're getting a tie if you just play the Magneto there at worst, which is, I think, a good scenario for Frodan. I would take it in that spot. You beat everything else as far as I can tell. Frodan needs to make a play. Time running out. Rodan needs to make a play. Time running out. Oh, my. All right. This so, is a snap as well. So this, this is everything. Yeah, that Magneto, Pulse Polaris, Cosmo. That gives you the win in the left lane. So you are going to be OK there. This Magneto turned off by the Cosmo you pulled. So wow. still the win for Frodan. Wow. Regardless of where they played it. But that was a tight looking turn for a bit there. Ooh. That's something really big to consider there, too, is because you have that spot pulling the opposing Cosmo means your opponent can't have the fresh effects from that spot. That is a really heads up spot. Death's Domain to start things off. That is so good for Frodan. Yeah, Frodan loves to see it as the Electro deck. Um, there's often a thought that Electro decks don't care that much about getting rid of the Electro because they're playing a ton of large cards. So you're not really trying to double spell very often anyways, so you're just getting rid of two power. That's not the case in Frodan's deck. Frodan's playing a controlling style deck. Hey, half of the deck is four or less cost cards. So you have cards that you can double up together on various turns. So Electro being gone, Frodan's deck very much benefits from that. And that means this death domain is going to be really strong. This is really big too. The Soul Stone getting doubled up on Onslaught Citadel. Daredevil yeah. from Florida inside, so a bit of info available. But we're kicking things off with an Electro on Death's Domain, which means that Froden has access to a turn four leech. And notably, Quinjet on Onslaught Citadel doesn't do that much for this Thanos deck because the only cards that you are reducing most of the time are the stones that already cost one. So this is not an added benefit here uh, for Mogwai, only getting advantage from that soul stone. So now Frodan really has the initiative here to wow. do something. I will say that the carnage here, I think is looking really sick on Atlantis. You're about to get a huge carnage that you can then move to death's domain. Oh, Frodan considering laying down a Cosmo here, but I, I think you just dropped this leech. It feels too good. If you're not dropping the leech here, what, you know, kind of in my head, it's like, what is this doing in the deck then? Well, you see Frodan's logic for dropping something like Armor Cosmo this turn is I get to play Destroyer next turn. I have, I have the energy to play Destroyer and I want to destroy minimum of my own things. But the flip side of it is Leeching your opponent in this spot is just absolutely devastating. Wow, She-Hulk oh. gets drawn. Oh. I mean, Frodan gets to see the play here as well, so this is a big deal. It, it absolutely is, because you see that the Carnage is going to get moved into Death's Domain. That's one problem lane for you. Now the She-Hulk into Atlantis, that's going to be 15 power, so you don't have a Professor X play there. Thanks to the double Soul Stone, you don't have a Professor X play on Onslaught Citadel. So what Frodan would like to do is really not available to them, considering even though this Daredevil is giving you full information, it's not giving you good information. It's giving you 
you're in trouble information. Well, you, you can piece this together a little bit. So Professor X is off the menu on the right side because of the double soul stone, like you said. So what else can you do to fight this? Is there anything you can do to fight this? Just drop a large destroyer in the middle lane. You, you've leached your opponent's hand. You're not as worried about a Shang-Chi as you could be. Uh, so that's one option. The problem with playing more things into Onslaught Citadel is you are just leaving yourself more and more vulnerable to the Soul Stone that's already in play. You're not adding enough stats there. I don't know, I'm feeling just drop a big man onto Atlantis and see what happens. I'm kind of liking it, honestly. Like, so if you just, if you plow destroyer down here, you you have the middle lane locked up, like you said, against everything except Shang-Chi at that point. So then do you have enough stats to overcome somewhere else? Once again, throw down, taking maximum time. Now, armor Jessica Jones going there. Armor has one attack after the soul stone. Jessica Jones has two. Once the unreveal goes off, you'll have six. So you're being competitive in that lane. Mogwai, this is a bluff snap from Mogwai's spot too. His hand is abysmal in that spot, but it's enough to get the job done. So Frodo ain't gonna retreat. And once again, every single game is playing for everything. Wow, this has been a long one. Yeah, three cubes for Mogwai, two cubes for Frodan. Oh, Mogwai still has the advantage my here. my gosh. Sunspot Cosmo Destroyer with a Nexus. Mogwai has the Shang-Chi, but that Cosmo is going to say no to that. So already Frodan has sort of the answer. And this is going to be a lot of information depending on what the players get. Mogwai getting Electro, that's not the card you want if you're the Thanos deck. And Frodan uh, got a She-Hulk. So you're pretty happy with that one, I think, most of the time. Yeah, of course, She-Hulk, one of the more awkward cards with Electro. Uh, you're not able to double spell at that point, but knowing the information about the She-Hulk is huge because it lets you know that you have an extra 10 power that you have to play around from Mogwai in hand there for the Frodan Nexus. needs to get initiative or needs to Cosmo right away. It looks like Frodan is going for the Electro, and that means the stones are going to be online here. Frodan's got two locations right now, so he does have initiative here. Nexus is uh, buffing up negative zone. And they're tied in the middle, so Frodan still has initiative here. If Frodan gives... drops Cosmo left. I'm thinking Frodan is going to Hobgoblin left, wanting to give that minus eight to all the lanes. It's I nothing wrong with that. But it, it would work out for you. I just, it, it feels like, how does your opponent, like, the only way they beat this is literally the arrow, I feel like, right? Yeah. Now, one card that we have to know is in Mogwai's deck is the Carnage. Of course, with the Cosmo follow-up, Frodan can counter that because Frodan, if this, um, if this Hobgoblin resolves, will almost certainly have initiative next turn. Uh, so the question is, can Frodan dodge uh, the carnage here if Mogwai were to even draw it? As that's the only real out to this Hobgoblin. Right, this is pretty crazy. Still a good play. You know, you're getting Step minus one. eight power in your head across the board with Nexus. Mogwai looks a little bit uncomfortable with it. No but initiative. Now you can see your opponent's play and Mogwai has initiative. So this is massive. Ooh. Yeah, Frodan's looking like they're going for lock up the lane. Yeah, Mogwai notably gets to see the place for the next two turns, thanks to Kang following up the Daredevil. So oh, this right. turn knows about the Magneto. Fortunately, has nothing to move, needs to make sure to play nothing to move, or just get rid of this Nexus, as you are having a hard time contesting this lane. Fill it with, real with the Reality Stone. And because you're changing Nexus into something else, this almost always is a benefit. It's a benefit in that it gives you a shot in the game. The downside here for Mogwai is you are saying that 
lane is lost. Short of a bar sinister popping up, you are not winning that lane anymore. That lane is gone. You have to focus on one of the other two lanes. And with a Kang and a full hand of cards, you do have a good shot of doing so. But that is very important here. Sunspot float the mana. Energy, excuse me. Wow, this is so tightly packed. I mean, Mogwai still has a chance to even retreat here if something goes absolutely wrong. All right. So now how, how does Frodian find the win? You have one card. Step one, you have priority. You can. You can't get Cosmoed. No disasters Wait here. You're going to get some information. If Frodian plays Destroyer, the left lane still won. He has a 15 power play where Mogwai, like, how, how, do they, how do they defeat this is kind of my question. Yeah, that that's the big question. And Frodan has not seen this Kang, so there isn't a, okay, make your second best play uh, and hope that there's a Kang so then you can juke it, even though... <laughs> Pretty cool. The She-Hulk is actually the second best play for, for Frodan if they had perfect information. So if Mogwai just Kangs here, sees the She-Hulk from Frodan, and then resets and plays around She-Hulk, that destroyer play could completely juke what Mogwai is doing. Oh my gosh. I, I'm I'm just afraid for both players. <laughs> it's so rare that I get afraid for both players when I'm watching the game, but my gosh, this is one of them. There's the Kang reveal. Frodan gives a laugh because we're doing the final turn again. <laughs> <laughs> Two cubes max, so this is not for the game, but Kang resets it all. And the question is, does Frodan see the destroyer line? Does Frodan see that with Mogwai being in the negatives in that lane, destroyer wins it anyway. So Mogwai is going to play around 10 and you can put 15. Nope, definitely not there. You do not want to add your She-Hulk to Necrotia. Uh, I that. think Frodan's not seeing it. He's not seeing that the Necrotia is obliterating it. Is, it. is this a fear of of uh, Blue Marvel here? I mean, it's, it feels really difficult to piece together what Mogwai has in the list. Again, because we are closed decklist for this first round. Gosh, it is really tough to, to believe that just some something big in the right lane is going to walk away with this one. Yeah, it, there is a good chance that both players are using a deck tracker, so Frodan may have pieced together most of Mogwai's deck at this point. Uh, we don't know exactly how many unique cards Frodan has seen uh, to know exactly what is coming out, but I think even with Mogwai just committing Magneto to the mid lane, if Frodan just goes for the same play again and doesn't make the mistake that some players do of, okay, my opponent's seen my play with Kang, I need to change it up. If Frodan just drops She Hulk in negative zone again, it's going to work. Wow! Yeah. Doesn't change it up. No Kang fear. And Frodan wins that one. We are going to a decider, admirable. This is about the maximum number of games you can play. Like we, we saw players retreat early and retreat early and retreat early. Like nothing came to fruition. It's just Round all ten. or nothing in this one. 10 games. Holy smokes. Uh oh. Space throne to start. Uh oh. I see a space throne. I see a two drop for Throwdown and I see a Polaris for Mogwai. If Throwdown drops this Daredevil anywhere, this is this is disaster. My yeah, gosh. this Polaris cannot hit Space Throne fast enough if you're Mogwai. Skellion. Okay, Frodan. so <laughs> it's Frodan's counterplay here. With Cerebro getting drawn, I feel like Storm here is a you very realistic option. Throne. You have to Storm Space Throne. You cannot allow yourself to lose just to a Decider Polaris on turn three. That cannot be how this 10 round game ends admirable. He has seen Polaris too. He knows it's there. I know that Frodan hates Space Throne. This is the location that absolutely feels like it, it mucks his hand every time. All right, step one done. Step one, you made the read. There you go, Mogwai, <laughs> you see the blink. All right, we're gonna have to do it the hard way. No easy win for Mogwai there. Frodan passes the first test. 
Cerebro is making this game pretty awkward, oh. too. Oh. What? Mirror Dimension turning what? into a second plotting now. We should say for viewers who may not know this interaction, because this flooding turned into flooding this turn, it is still going to be flooding next turn. So they have one more turn to play to that lane. No rush to play to the middle lane this turn. The left lane will get locked up, but not the middle. So that is something that both players should be aware of, uh, and that may go into their decision making. Did you see what road and Drew? I, I I wasn't paying that much attention. I saw the second flooding and it like blinded my eyes <laughs> where I was like, oh my gosh, this is like not what you want to see is, is stuff like this happening. Yeah, whatever Frodo and Drew, I'm guessing it was Jessica Jones considering that's the only play and it looks like there's no energy floating. So Jessica Jones into the left flooding would lock that one up for Frodo. Oh, Jessica Jones. No. Oh, that's... It's hefty. That's not great. Frodan has no real way to add power to that left lane now. That was the lane that you really needed to prioritize there, considering this second flooding is still live for a turn. This, this is disaster. So this is interesting for me, like with Mogwai having priority now, that tells Frodan a lot. And it tells me that he is looking for a Magneto win at this point, because you're going to be pulling Polaris, you're going to be pulling Cosmo, both players are very aware that Magnetos are here, so Mogwai's options feel like completely fill up the opposite lane or to try to fight for the position that's currently there. If that's the case, if Frodan is just going for a Magneto win, then I wouldn't be surprised to just see after seeing these plays, Frodan go for a leech here. You don't want to Hobgoblin because that would fill up your opponent's Triskelion. You can't really uh, play as if you are not winning that lane because you're going to lose both Floods potentially. So I think it's just Leech. Hope your opponent can only play one card next turn, which as of the current hand for Mogwai and, you know, not all draws because there's a lot of stones in this deck, but some of the draws, Mogwai will not be able to play two things. Ooh, this is this is a close one. Is there any way you can get like a weird hazmat win or something? Like, say you hobgoblin the right lane, you drop a hazmat, your opponent has more stuff. Like, I'm I'm trying to piece together anything I can here that makes sense with this. Hazmat would lose, continue losing the left lane. It would tie the middle lane, so that would at least be a start. You would only be losing the left lane. Wait a Buy minute. two is, stats. Like, is there like a hazmat cerebro? That would only buff the Jessica Jones. I don't think well, it would Jessica be Jessica Jones would go to two power. Line. So it would go to two power. Hazmat would go to two. Is that right? And then you could have Quinjet afterwards. This is wild. Like, it, this is really tough to evaluate. Can Frodan go for hazmat Quinjet cerebro? If you hazmat and then you quinjet and then you quinjet and then you cerebro. Hazmat has two, Quinjet has two. The sunspot is only a one. That's Eight? just worse than the Quinjet here. Honestly, Rodan needs to see that. Okay, so Mogwai has priority, is adding what is essentially 14 power here. So it's going to 10. Hazmat will shrink it down by four. So going to six. Has that Quinjet Cerebro wins it? If you take the Sunspot back, you play Quinjet Cerebro, you win it if you're Frodan. You well, just Mag need to see it. Magneto's coming into effect here as well. Like, what does Magneto pull? Oh, it's pulling the Jessica Jones. You're no longer winning that middle lane. Oh. Well. It would be a 50-50. There's one spot open. So if it pulled the storm instead of the Jessica Jones. 
Rodan oh, doesn't Vodian. see the cerebral line. Ah, I, I think he sees it. He's just out of time, so he has to lock something in. He's just going through every single option. It would have pulled the storm. storm. Oh, no. This man shrinks everything. It's a tie in the middle. Wait, the sunspot extra. One point. One, One point. point. Wow. Oh, my God. This has to be just about the closest match I think that we've seen in the entire tournament. It is one cube that Mogwai survives with. It is by one power that Mogwai survives with. And about one more second, I think, for Frodan to see the outcome there, because you could see him cycling through every single option that was available. And I think at the very end, it was the time pressure that didn't give him the ability to go back and, and piece that one together real quick. Pretty, that is a that is a nutso outcome. That was crazy. Frodan really thought through that turn, as he did for most of the match, right? Really thought through the plays and made sure to think through the possibilities and just couldn't find that line. And still, it came down to one point of power, which is absolutely ridiculous at the end of what was that 45 minutes admirable? <laughs> it was it was a lot of time, but honestly, I think well worth it. That That is just a fantastic match to see. Yeah, that was a delight. Wow. Hey, we got more matches that are coming up, so go ahead and stick around for this one. It's the loser's bracket round one that we're getting through. And once that's wrapped up, players are getting sent home just like Rodin did in that one. Stay tuned. This episode of the Infinity Gauntlet is brought to you by BCW Supplies, our go-to source for protecting our prized collectibles. From cards to comics to coins, BCW Supplies has top-tier options to store, protect, and show off your rarest gems. Head over to bcwsupplies.com and use the code ISP10 to get 10% off your entire order. BCW Supplies. Protect store display. Welcome back to the Infinity Gauntlet. We are in round one of the losers bracket. That means whoever loses is going home. Marie Bartholdi and Moni Davuti with you here. We're going to take a look up at Blevins versus Dexter here in this round, Moni. Starting off with Blevins playing some Shuri. Yeah, this is one of the most powerful decks in the game right now. We have heard there is a considerable nerf coming to uh, this Shuri deck. So we're waiting to see what that is. But for the time being, Blev is really uh, bringing a powerhouse to his loser's bracket run. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. But nothing really too crazy in this version of the deck. The big card I see that you don't see in all lists is Polaris. There is also a copy of Arnim Zola. So that is the choice for I have one more slot to do something big, whether it's we've seen Captain Marvel from some players, we've seen uh, Typhoid Mary from some players. This version, going for Arnim Zola. Blevins plays a lot of card games, most notably Terra, hoping to make a mark in the snap here as well. Dexter, the opponent, the name that they chose for their deck is NSNP, and I believe that stands for No Shuri, No Problem. Yeah, it seems like it looking at the deck. I see a red skull, I see a zero, but I don't see a sherry. And if you're right, if that's what that stands for, then this is really going to be the test as you are going up for it. no sherry, no problem against the sherry. And that's the test for how your deck will do. Absolutely. Moni, I have to ask you, why no sherry though? I don't really know it you know we saw the previous round frodan being free to play and bringing the cards that he has but i don't think that's a problem for dexter so just going with a bit more of a controlling build here not wanting to be all in maybe that's the reason uh and it could work out of course because this is the loser's bracket we haven't seen 
these players uh, played these decks before. They played a different deck in the upper bracket. So we have no idea if this deck is good. Uh, it certainly looks like Dexter is going for a bit more of a controlling build, uh, trying to have more interaction with bars like Shang-Chi and Cosmo, as well as Scorpion to affect your opponent's plays. And then Dr. Doom as one of the end game pieces of this deck to really go wide on the board and take control. So I don't know if I really see what he's going for with this deck, but I'm sure Dexter has a reason to bring it. Absolutely, Dexter snap streamer. Love watching him. Let's get into the game. Decide once and for all, do you need Shuri or do you just not need her? Here we go. <laughs> Nidavell here, the first location. Yeah, notably for Dexter, the interaction cards that he has access to are pretty good in this matchup. Shang-Chi going to be a good one uh, to destroy the one big thing that the Shuri deck is able to put out. Arrow can do a good job of interrupting the Arnim Zola, as can Cosmo for both Taskmaster and Arnim Zola. So there is a decent amount of interaction that Dexter has here. And for Blevins, so far your game plan isn't doing the thing yet. No Shuri in hand, no Red Skull, nothing, no She-Hulk. There's nothing big to follow up what the start is from Blevins so far. Zero on a Titania there for Blevins. Bar Sinister, the third location revealed, which always makes things super interesting, Monty. Yeah, step one, ding, you found the Sherry. Uh, now you can use Polaris in the mid lane to pull off one of these Scorpion or Sunspot from Dexter, as well as most likely Strand Dexter with a rock. So this is still decent here uh, for Blevins with that Sherry, but it's really going to be a question of who can abuse this bar sinister better and whether Blevins will draw a play to follow up this Sherry. Ooh, Maria, that Iceman was huge. Iceman nailing Shuri, upping the cost to five. That is <laughs> enormous money. Polaris dragging Sunspot over, sticking Dexter with the rock. But you're right, that was huge. Yeah, and, you know, there is a, a belief among uh, the community that it feels like the Shuri players always have Shuri into Red Skull into Taskmaster. Somehow oh, they, they just have always it, draw it. It's well, not a belief. Blevins is, <laughs> Blevins is fully proving that here. Uh, so now there is something cool happening here where Blevins can play four Shuris with this Bar Sinister and then just play the biggest Red Skull you've ever seen to happen i want it to happen but shang chi yeah and if dexter plays this cosmo this turn as it it looks like sorry the cosmo was the previous turn dexter is passing the turn to have access to she hulk red skull but blevins can just take advantage of this cosmo and use that uh to go alongside uh this jury combo if he wanted but it looks like just going to go for red skull plus most likely artem zola instead yeah, With Red priority, Skull. this yeah. will dodge uh, a Shang-Chi. Uh, but the question is, can Dexter suss out this Arnim Zola and play into the other two lanes? Yeah, it's not, of course, a known fact that Blevins is running Arnim Zola. Not every Shuri list wants Arnim Zola or runs it. So because we are still in closed deck list here in round number one of the loser's bracket, Dexter just straight up doesn't know that he has that card. Oh, Wow. Blevins has actually gone for Cosmo in the mid lane uh, alongside a Lizard in the left lane. So now the Shang-Chi from Dexter is very live and Shang-Chi She-Hulk is going to win this game. Neither player looks like they're confident enough for a snap here, but this is more than good enough for Dexter to get the job done here. And that's going to be two cubes going towards Dexter. That Shang-Chi taking down Lizard and Red Skull. You saw Blevins kind of shrug at the camera making that play like, I don't know, man. <laughs> and She-Hulk's going to copy and bar Sinister. And it's going to do it. Dexter taking down game number one here versus the Blevins. Yeah, so, so far, the control Shuri. elements. Yeah. That's what we're on watch. We're on watch of Does Shuri Matter? <laughs> Yeah, really, that game's MVP was Iceman, just making sure that Blevins had no turn four play, getting rid of that Shuri is a possibility, just completely destroyed Blevins' game plan, and uh, 
This is what Dexter's deck is trying to do, is trying to disrupt, is trying to make sure that your opponent's deck can't function, and so far so good if you're in Dexter's seat. Here's Scorpion into Atlantis. It looks like Levin's considering that zero play, but uh, holding back. Scorp's gonna shrink down everything Blevin says going on. Daily Bugle location number three along with Bifrost in the middle. <laughs> you're not playing Taskmaster if you're, if you're Dexter, but you can still get one from your opponent's Daily Bugle. And I like the decision not to play zero the previous turn from Blevins, knowing that if you're going to play zero into Lizard anyways, you're not going to have another play to play the next turn. So you're just limiting yourself from being able to play something like this Cosmo instead if you play the zero. So this patience means that Blevins had more options for the turn. It does ultimately go with zero lizard anyways, but it, there was no cost to him to do so. Yeah, that's why I love zero so much as a card in Snap because you can use it to kind of take away the abilities of cards like lizard early on or Titania or whatever, or you can save it for a red skull later. Yeah, you, you saw Dexter uh, play that Cosmo, does end up paying off as negates that Polaris, so it, Blevins is not able to uh, fill up that lane potentially using the Polaris ability to draw the Scorpion. Uh, and that means that it's still anyone's game here. Dexter able to play the Red Skull into Taskmaster and would be able to tie that lane with the Sunspot buff if that's the multi-turn line that he wants to go to. Of course, Blevins, thanks to Daily Bugle, knows about the Red Skull. So he could play a Red Skull of his own if he wants. Yeah, and it looks like that's what he's going to do. <laughs> playing a Red Skull, and he's playing Dexter's Red Skull, too, by the way. You can tell from the border. <laughs> oh, that was mine. There it is. <laughs> Over in Daily Bugle, taking that lane there for Blevins. Yeah, and now the question is, you just go for Taskmaster. Arrow is not going to do anything. What is the one drop in... Uh... Levins' hand, excuse me. Oh, the Titania. Titania, and yeah. Aero Titania will do the job here. Uh, Taskmaster in the mid lane will get pulled to Atlantis, and then Titania will win the mid lane. So that's going to be Blevins evening it up. Uh, the question is, is there any confidence in the snap? And it doesn't look like there is. Yeah, I think the, when, the decision of when to snap when you're playing a tournament like this in battle mode is a, is a separate game in and of itself. Yeah, knowing that round five, the stakes get doubled, means that it is very much in your advantage to put your opponent on the back foot before then. Uh, but it's always risky, especially if you're in Dexter, Dexter's spot where you have priority here. Again, we're currently in closed deck list. Dexter doesn't know if Blevins is running something like a Shang-Chi, so doesn't want to risk it. And ultimately it plays around sherry kind of by playing everything to the left lane anyways but that is not going to get the job done against the titania and that is going to be blevins evening it up all right we're even stevens here heading into round number three of blevins versus dexter here in the infinity gauntlet kicking things off first location reveal it's new york yeah anytime new york gets flipped up it immediately changes uh the game plan for the game you're going to see players avoiding playing into it more often. So we're going to see players playing into the dark here rather than uh, going into New York and... Well... <laughs> There's the pink <laughs> for the second location. I'm just going to flip the script here. I... It's really interesting because Blevins' Red Skull just got completely nerfed. A baby now. A baby. However, Blevins has a zero cost yeah. five power Arnim Zola. Arnim Zola. If Levitz has any big thing to use that Arnim Zola with, it's going to be absolutely massive. And he has until the end of the game to find it. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't that many big plays left in the deck. But, man, it, it, if it, Levitz it can find a way to... Okay, there's a She-Hulk. All right, there's She-Hulk. Iceman hit that zero in Blevins' hand last turn. Cosmo into the peak for Blevins as well. Just past the turn. Yep, Dexter's just gonna leave with a zero into Savage Land. Sunspot up to five. Here's Red Skull. Yeah, so the zero Red Skull means that you're going to have 23 power in the mid lane if you're Blevins. Uh, if, if you're Dexter, excuse me. Uh, 
it looks like Blevins is actually going to be playing a zero uh, into Savage Land, followed up by the Titania, uh, and maybe even the She-Hulk here. The real question is... Ooh. Snap! Dexter! Snap from Dexter. It, the Dance of New York is still coming next turn. Neither player has actually filled up a lane yet, even though it looks like uh, Blevins is filling up a lane and Dexter is filling up a lane. Neither player has filled up a lane. Dexter deciding to put Red Skull over into Savage Line for now, but like you said, New York is coming. All right. The cute snap, is good. The snap resolves. <laughs> it resolves. There's zero into Titania for Blevins, into New York, She-Hulk into the middle. That was a lot of high power plays for Be Blevins last turn, but this is going to be where the money is in turn number six. Yeah, I think Dexter just wants to go for Dr. Doom. I would guess that Blevins is planning on moving this Cosmo to New York and then moving something from Savage Land to New York and dropping Arnim Zola in the middle lane to copy this She-Hulk uh, in both of the other lanes. Uh that feels like the line that Blevins yeah. may want to take. The question is, is it good enough? And also, what is your follow-up, considering you can still play something? Ooh, Dexter nervous about this Doctor Doom decision here in Savage Land. <laughs> Moving to New York. It's the story of everyone from the Midwest, let me tell you. <laughs> All right, Dexter's turn is done. What's the game plan here? Looks like Taskmaster Zero. Oh, it's that back. back from Blevins. It's on the line here in this match. This is huge, Monty. It really is. Dexter has given up on New York. So eight cubes being played for here. And is Arnim Zola just being played for power here? Taskmaster, copy She-Hulk, Arnim Zola for power into the Cosmo lane. Dr. Doom goes off, and that's that, that's it. That's it. Wow. That's the entire Jordan game. Takes it down. Dexter is out of the tournament. Wow, Monty. What did you make of that matchup? No fancy place. Nothing, just raw stats there from Plevins and... No Sherry, no problem. Well, that was true for both decks. Uh, Blevins <laughs> never really played the Sherry, never needed to. Yeah. Just getting the job done thanks to some fancy footwork from New York, and that flipped Arnim Zola from the peak, really coming through clutch there for some extra stats for just zero cost in the last turn. Absolutely. It looked like the peak was going to be, you know, lights out for him, them sh uh, Blevins shrinking down the Red Skull, but getting that I power Arnim Zola was really sweet, it turned out, in the end. Well, good games, Dexter out of the tournament, unfortunately, but Levens moves on, lives to fight another day with this really, really powerful Shuri list, though still unresolved if he needs it or not. More snap after this. <laughs>
put them in the cannon. How many different ways can you kill Deadpool? Well, in this deck, there's quite a lot. You got Carnage, you got Venom, you got Killmonger, you got Deathlock. Pump, 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 pump up everything up with Bass and win. I think this is a very cool list. It's a pretty powerful uh, turn six if you can get these things buffed up as well. Playing Deadpool into Taskmaster can create some wild swings. And so, since we're still in the first round of the loser's bracket, neither player knows what the other player is bringing to the table right now. So if you're sitting in Amaz's spot, your deck's going to get sniffed out very quickly. It's not hard to spot. If you're in Fino's spot, how on earth could you know what's happening until you see this? Yeah, I think the Taskmaster might be a little surprising for a Moss to see later on in the game. We'll find out if it pans out like that. Let's head on down to the game. All right, here we go. Fino versus Amaz. We've got Galactus on the bottom, Deadpool on the top, and Hala is the first location. A classic headshot from Fino on this one. I do want to note that Fino was... Uh, Recording this on an iPad was actually in a different location and had to travel around while they were doing that. And honestly, I think that speaks to part of the beauty of Marvel Snap. You can play it from anywhere at any time. Absolutely. One of those locations, famously the toilet, uh, as is noted <laughs> by a title you can have in the game. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a true story. Uh, I'm, I am not a titles player myself. I will typically omit those because that is two extra clicks I have to accomplish. And frankly, just I don't have time for that. You don't got time for that. Camp Lahai was the second location, Shadowland the third. Here's Ironheart coming down for Amaz. That Camp Lahai Bast for Fino pumping up the hand, followed by Forge. <laughs> you see Amaz click on Forge real quick, like, what does this do? Oh, yeah, right, right, right. And so that's really I, the opening step for this is that you're looking at Deadpool coming down at five power to start. And so that is a massive boost. Like you're looking at five power into 10 power into 20 power right off the, right off the bat. Yeah, that's huge. And that's where you can see the power of why you're including a card like Bast and Forge in this list. There's Deadpool at five and here's Deathlock. It's gonna kill it immediately along with Wolverine. Just Thanks to new buffs is gonna be uh, larger as well, coming at four power, going right back to Hala. I will say that for Amaz here, this is got to be a mild concern. You don't have a Galactus in hand. So you're gonna have to play this game fair. Yeah, and that's something a Galactus player doesn't know anything about, you know what I mean? <laughs> Sorry. No, I don't that's know what you mean, because I don't have Galactus. I play Galactus too. I'm just joshing everybody. but I'm... I just want to know what it's like. <laughs> oh, it feels good. It feels good, man. Mr. Being... Prone, give me the Galactus! Sometimes being bad feels good, you know? Oh, yeah, I, I totally know that feeling. I mean, I've been playing card games for a long time. I know how good it feels to be bad. And there's Wave? Deadpool at 10 already. Wave certainly is going to hurt this strategy a little bit, although I think Frodan might, I'm sorry, uh, Fino might have the right side pretty locked up on this one. They're looking at 14 power on the right side. In their mind, I'm thinking that they, they feel like this is pretty locked. And yeah, with everything could... costing four this turn, this is definitely an advantage to Amaz. Fino does, you know, I think that you could make the assumption sometimes that Nola's here, but the very first game, I think you'd kind of have to see it to know it's going to be there. I think it's likely to know that yeah. uh, your opponent's, you know, got something like a like a She-Hulk or some big mana cheat that's going on here. Right, exactly. You don't play Wave just to play one card for four. I mean, sometimes you do, but I mean, this is way better, right? Playing that Null with 17 and that Death with 12 is just huge. Yeah, Safina locked into one play. Amaz going to lock it in as well. We're going to see a game one win from Amaz. Just lots of cheating stuff into play. And now when you see that null come down, Fino's got to be shaking their head a little bit going, oh, geez, that can't be good. Yeah, absolutely. That's Amaz taking down game number one versus Fino with that huge play off wave. Don't always need Galactus to win with Galactus. Just like you don't story. always need Shuri to win with Shuri. Yeah, we, we, we definitely saw that in the previous one. No Shuri, no problem. Two extra cards drawn. That's got to be a nice. huge favor for Amaz here as well. You know, the whole idea of the deck is Mana Cheat Galactus. Yeah, and we've got Mana Cheats in hand, and we've got Galactus too, as well as... There's Sunspot into Olympia for Amaz, and Bucky Barnes into Washington, D.C. for Fino. Sinister London might mess up some plans here, though. This is kind of interesting to me as well, because Amaz can't afford to just take risks with Sinister London because Galactus is going to be the centerpiece of the strategy. You need a lane open. So I am right. I think that this honestly can kind of give away some of the plays here as well, where if Fino is playing really close attention to this and trying to piece together this puzzle, 
the big question you're gonna ask is, well, wait a second, why isn't my opponent playing into Sinister London? He does not know that Amaz is running Galactus at this point. He might make a guess, but he doesn't know for sure. There's Carnage. It's going to eat things up there in Sinister London. Wave was the play, though, for Amaz. Everything's four now. Yeah, Fino's side looking a little bit tough. Nothing that's really super stand out. From Amaz's side, you have used the wave to cheat some mana. So what's the best play you can make at this point? Mm. You're on four, so it's looking like Galactus is likely to be the play here, I think. Oh, yeah, Mufino's going to get completely destroyed by this. Deathlock hits, Bucky Barnes, but none of that is going to be relevant at the end. It's Galactus coming into play solely. Galactus has entered the building in Sinister London, blows everything up, leaving behind just a carnage for Fino. Yeah. Okay, yeah. who gets it here? Well, I can tell you that Dr. Octopus into this hand is going to give it to a boss at this dead. point. Seems we dead. We can piece this one together, I think, with just seeing the hands themselves. Uh, <laughs> I'm just but... like, what? Is there anything you can grab <laughs> that hoses a moss? But uh... <laughs> yeah, you could go grab a drink real quick and let the time run out. But you know, you, you have one more round to to go ahead and retreat on this one. I cannot imagine sticking around after seeing the Doctor Octopus, though. Um, I, I've noticed that it seems very typical for Galactus players. Maybe Maria, you can uh, you can yeah. confirm mm -hmm. or deny this. Uh, yeah, sure. I've heard that Galactus players really don't snap that much. Um. <laughs> I don't know, man. I feel like Galactus players snap me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't snap all the time because I just get scared. <laughs> I play scared. The only deck I ever felt confident snapping with was my Silver Surfer deck, which is what, where I hit infinite. So that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, Silver Surfer. Like, Silver Surfer was the card I think that baited me the most when I was playing, where I was like, what is my opponent? Do oh, right. Oh, and it just kept winning. happening over and over again. Right. Yeah, yeah. So just that that's... alone is Goodbye. Enough. <laughs> There's Doc Ock pulling out some real, Victory. some real, just sad cards for Fino there on the retreat. So Amaz is going to take that one as well. Must be feeling pretty good here, heading into round number three with those two wins under his belt. Yeah, it's kind of just natural for Doctor Octopus to function, I think, very well versus what Fino's brought as well. But the whole deck is focused around synergy. So when a card like Doctor Octopus hits, it's just gonna it's just gonna wipe your opponent's hand away. And you know, you're like, yeah, here you go, have a bunch of free stuff. But all the free stuff needs to be played in an orderly fashion for Fino to really take advantage of it. Oh my gosh! There's the peak again. We've seen it a lot today. I'm telling you, it, it sometimes it's just a featured location. Interesting. Taskmaster is now an 05 here. Washington DC, not a huge impact there. So Ma's really missing a lot of key cards in this particular game. And I think that could be a pretty big impact. No Galactus in hand for Amaz. Forge is going to pump up Killmonger, which is going to take out the Sunspot for Amaz there from Fino that play that Ooh. turn. Don't mind to see that. I will say that it feels like every single time that I use a Bucky Barnes on Washington DC with a Carnage that my opponent has a Shang-Chi in hand. We can see that is the rule here as well from Amaz's side. Yeah, that is true. There's the Winter Soldier currently sitting at nine power in DC. That's really the big question here though, is how Amaz wins this one. Electro has come down. So two, tur two turns for big power plays. Maz thinking about the good doctor here again. Honestly, Shang-Chi into Null is not the like the worst. You're getting four power off the Shang-Chi. You're pumping up the Null to 11 at that point. Fiona's going to go for a Venom play this turn. It's going to open up Taskmaster. Venom. Young, that's, getting, young. that's getting pulled out, though. So, so for Fino, this hand is getting wiped out entirely. What order are these coming in? Oh, <laughs> no. Taskmaster. Oh, copying the Venom. Deathlock's going to shoot him all down. <laughs> no. Oh, that is the, the worst. Oh, that's pain. That is pain. Oh, boy. And here's Shang-Chi for Amaz, too. If he does on the retreat later line here. Definitely oh, don't yeah. mind to see that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was like, how is he not flush retreat already? All right. He definitely did. I wonder if my opponent will retreat after I blew up all of my good cards. Hey, I, you know, I will say if the Moss's hand is just completely garbage in this one, 
I think this is, I think the retreat later is definitely kind of a sign here. You know, your point could have like a Psylocke, Wave, like just all sorts of nonsense that doesn't really win the fights at this point. Round three victory going to Amaz, who is yet unblemished here in this matchup versus Fino. <laughs> Big house, the first location. Both paths. Oh, that's, that could be really big here. So if Amaz draws Electro here, even Psylocke could be acceptable. That one's really not the one you're hoping to see. So no impact here on either side. Tinker's Workshop. Second location, Bucky Barnes into the big house for Fino. Wakandan Embassy to power to all the cards in the player's hands. And here comes Wave. Yes, yeah, so that's Wave. And then it's important to note the locations here. Dr. Yeah, Octopus cannot be played in the left lane. And there is a Ooh. snap from Fino. And he plays one out. I will say that the Bast certainly loses a little bit of its uh, of its power when you don't have Deadpool in these kinds of hands. We saw the natural buff yeah. onto, onto Forge as well. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Forge. Here's Wave in the big house. It's going to... Make everything cost a little bit more for Fino. Oh, you can't play on the big house with this. Everything costs four. Yeah. We're locking it down, <laughs> and Amaz is like, it's Galactus time, baby. Got death in hand for some huge stats. Oh, Amaz is going to snap back. Right. Fino on another retreat. All right. Yeah, Fino's like, I am out of here. Absolutely not. <laughs> Honestly, Fino's deck looks like it's it's decent overall. I feel like this matchup, when I'm starting to watch it, the, these, you know, these pieces get put together, it feels like the matchup just is absolutely terrible. Look, I love Fino's deck. I think it's very cool. I tried playing it. I did not win games with it. <laughs> I don't know if that's just me and it's trying to be, or, you know, I just, I'm just not good enough with it or that it's too cute. I don't know. Well, you did mention you were getting snapped by Galactus players all the time. So, well, you know, <laughs> that's just every day of my life, basically. <laughs> no, getting uh, discarded ooh. from Amaz's side. Nothing super relevant on Fino's. And so, you know, Amaz does have Electro and Galactus available, but the Null being gone, I think, can really affect some of the plans that you would have in order. Right. You've got to have the payoff with Galactus, too in some way, shape, or form to help you win after you've blown everything up. But Fino kind of up against it here. No wins yet to his name in this match with Amaz, who has had no losses so far. Electro's coming. Still looking for the big plays, I think, on Amaz's side. Again, Galactus, that is the centerpiece card, but you have to, you have to get the rest of it in order as well. There's Deathlock shooting everything down. Wolverine into DC. Looks like this might be a Bast Forge turn for Fino. Bast, Demon, Forge, and then you use the Taskmaster to try to change the outcome on that. And Electro locking Amaz into just one play every turn. Lizard into Sokovia. Here comes Bast. Yeah, so Moz is moving away from Galactus here entirely. He says, I need to put together another strategy here. You're trying to secure enough power in the center that you can justify playing into one lane, but that, that is missing right now. Venom is going to be the play for oh, Fino here. I, I will say the death definitely changes your idea of Ooh, <laughs> how the Galactus yeah, that's is going to work. Okay, okay, yeah, drawing death there. Amaz is like, all right, are we going back to the Galactus plan? Where do we want to do it? Do we want to put it in DC where we feel confident that death is going to be big enough or are we just going to risk it here in the hub? This is kind of an interesting spot here too because some things could really go wrong for for Amaz, I think, in this spot. Although with the Shang-Chi in hand, I, it's hard to see it going completely wrong. Like I'm thinking of the Wolverine doing like a double flip here back onto the Galactus side and Amaz just not having enough power to get it done. Yeah, I have been bested by Wolverine playing Galactus before. Absolutely. Been hosed by that card. Here's Venom. Ooh. Going to lunch. It's going to be huge. Enough said, Bob. And where does it go? It goes into Sokovia. Okay. Okay. There's flip. the Galactus. Yep. Absolutely. Double pump on that Wolverine. 
Galactus shows off the power that comes along with being like a god or whatever. And the best part of that is destroying stuff. <laughs> And look at that, that's 19 power and 8 from the Wolverine. We've got Death, we've got Shang-Chi wow. though for Amaz. I mean, that's really the critical play is the difference that the Death brought to the table here. Amaz needed a power play, the Null got discarded early, but found Death. This is kind of like speaking to sometimes the, the power that America Chavez can really give to these decks that rely on certain cards. You are going to sacrifice your final draw, but you want your plan to already be in order by that point. So Chavez showing up on the last turn, it's it's a much different deal than if you know that you just have a random card floating around and it can so sometimes destroy that consistency of your draw. You are sacrificing power for consistency at that point. And you're, you're kind of seeing the effect that it's been having in these games, like both players having consistent draws. But at the end of the day, it's the big power plays to get it done. Absolutely, and there is Shang-Chi showing off here, giving Amaz wow. yet another victory. And in fact, the match over Fino here in the lower loser's bracket. That's Amaz staying alive to fight another day. Fino, out of the tournament. Are you surprised, Nathan? Well, when I see a Deadpool deck show up, uh, not super surprised by it. That definitely is a deck that is gonna require a lot more strong outcomes in your favor to really function. And again, watching it come into a Galactus matchup, watching that in hindsight, it feels like a very difficult one to overcome in this. Like you don't have an armor, obviously, because you're playing destroy cards. Uh, your opponent's playing Galactus and completely ruining the, the synergy that you're trying to put together, which is just having priority over all three lanes, making one big power play to lock it up and hoping your opponent doesn't have enough to get the rest together. That's the power that Galactus boasts, is that sometimes it just completely throws those in the trash. If you don't have cards like Debris, if you don't have cards uh, like Cosmo or Arrow in your deck, it, it's going to be really tough to overcome the power that Galactus brings to the table. Yeah, there's Galactus really showing off for us today. Let's take a look at our bracket, everybody. That's going to do it for round number one here of the loser's bracket. Uh, but keep in mind, we went through round one of the winner's bracket uh, last week. So if you missed any of those videos, check it out. So all the players we saw lose today are unfortunately out of the tournament. Although, Nathan, they're not going home empty-handed. No, they are not. They're taking home $62.50. <laughs> I want to be very specific about that because this was a $3,000 prize pool that was distributed all the way down to the final place of the tournament. And I, I love seeing that for invitationals, even if a player uh, does not have what it takes to get through the tournament at this time, what it means is they're not walking away empty handed for their time. And I, I love to see that right now until we get a strong established competitive field and competitive tournament structure. I think that's the way these should be operating. Players going home empty handed right now that are in invitational events, I think uh, is something that we should not be seeing. All right, so our next uh, video, we're gonna bring you some more action from the winner's side of the bracket, as well as some more loser's bracket matches we're gonna be bouncing around. Until then, everybody, thank you so much for watching. Keep on snapping for 983 Media. This was the Infinity Gauntlet.